So again, this will be a um, spreadsheet exercise. So in this work, we get to practice with a really simple um, example, doing some risk calculations. Like some of the other earlier exercises, there's parts in the exercise where some of the details have been filled out for you. That's mostly in the interest of time but so that you still have kind of an example, a full example, right? So that if, if you want to after the fact or if you get done early, you can explore some of the formulas and setup that's been pre-populated for you to kind of get a, a better feel and understanding on how these, um, how risk calculations are typically set up and how they work. So first one is just do, like as we've done with the other exercises, do a little bit of exploration. Um, and then we're going to calculate um, a risk estimate using um, two, uh, well, actually three of the methods we talked about um, in the lecture. So one is we're going to do uh, what we call it a marginal risk estimate for two failure modes. So that's where you just estimate each failure mode kind of in isolation. And then we're going to do what, what um, what is called in the exercise an exclusive risk model. So in the exclusive risk model, we make a simplifying assumption that the um, failure modes are mutually exclusive. In practice, they almost never are, but also in practice, the intersections between failure modes is often small enough that if we're doing something like a screening level risk assessment, we can um, keep the model simple and just estimate the failure modes and then add them up. So that's the exclusive risk model. We didn't cover that really in the presentation, but it's a technique we use um, often in screening level risk assessments uh, just because it's really simple and easy to do. And then the last one will be to um, do risk for um, the joint risk model. So this is where you assume that you're going to explicitly account for the probability of two ferry modes happening during the same flood event um, and how that risk estimate would, would play out. And when you do that, you either have to estimate the consequences for that joint flood event explicitly, or you have to make some sort of assumption about what those consequences would be from your estimates of the individual ferry modes. And some of that's already done for you in the, in the results. And then the last step is just to compare the risk models to see how similar or how different the estimate of annual failure probability and uh, average annual life loss is between the different um, options. So this last exercise was to um, just get some little bit of practice with um, a basic example of, of risk calculations and how they work in terms of having a hazard uh, system response and consequences and combine them into a risk estimate. So uh, the hazard system response and consequences were given for you. This is for a hypothetical levy. Um, uh, someone noted in the chat and had a really good observation and question about um, the values in the exercise and how they sum up. So we'll see this. Um, in the risk calculation slide. But if you remember at um, earlier in the course when we talked about some of the concepts on probability theory, that you know if we've covered all the events, probability should add up to one. And uh, someone noticed that that was not the case in this example. So the main reason for that is because this particular hypothetical levy only sees a loading uh, at the toe of, the toe of the levy here starting at roughly a 0.5 annual exceedance probability, which is a two-year flood event. So um, to simplify the calculations, we've basically excluded everything below the toe of the levy because if the levy doesn't get loaded above the toe, it can't fail. and if water doesn't get above the toe, you're not going to have consequences. So um, we could have included that as an additional point or two or three in our uh, hazard curve to make it more complete, but we took a shortcut in this exercise and left out everything more frequent than the two-year flood out of the calculations. So when we um, sum up for example, probabilities in our in our risk calculations, they're only going to sum 
to basically the value we started at, which is 0.5, and you'll see that later in the risk calculation. So uh, there's the hazard, two system response curves um, that cross each other, and uh, consequence estimates for um, if the levy fails, if the levy doesn't fail, and then um, the excess or the incremental consequences, which is the, just the difference between those, those two values. Um, so again, we need to do that to calculate the different types of risk, whether we're calculating failure risk, non-failure risk, um, excess or incremental risk, or the background risk. So in this example here, we're, uh, the first thing was to calculate um, the excess risk um, using a simplified approach where we assume the two failure modes are mutually exclusive. So most of this was filled out for you just to give you, if you haven't done this or seen one set up like this, um, just to give you kind of the flavor for how you can set up these types of risk calculations. Um, there's other ways to do it. Uh, obviously, this is just one way. So in this case, um, we have to divide up our flood hazard into loading intervals. Remember, we've talked about that a lot, doing these little slices that essentially define the rectangles for our rectangle rule approximation of the risk integral. So those intervals, we have a, on each interval, right, we have a, a low stage and a high stage that, that kind of bound the, the endpoints of the interval. Um, for our frequency curve, you can do this by stage or you can increment things by annual exceedance probability. I usually prefer stage. I think you run into less, uh, less potential for um, um, numerical inaccuracies if you do it by stage, but you know you can do it either way. This one's done by stage. So two foot, uh, assuming this is speed, two foot increments of stage. Um, and then what we want to do for this, this is um, this is analogous to a rectangle rule implementation of the calculation. So what we're doing is we're calculating um, what the stage is at the midpoint of our interval. And in this simple example, we just use the arithmetic mean of the two endpoints. We talked earlier in the week about the geometric mean and applications where you might want to use the geometric mean as a more accurate representation of the, the average or midpoint, right? Which, in a real risk analysis, might be more appropriate for this type of this type of um, scenario. But in this one, we we just took the simple approach and did the arithmetic average. And then um, you also need the the AEPs, annual exceedance probabilities, corresponding to the two endpoints of your interval. So we have a high value um, corresponding to one stage. Um, actually, the high AEP corresponds to the lower stage, and the low AEP corresponds to the higher stage because as stage goes up, uh, exceeds probability goes down. So that kind of gives us a definition of our of our kind of rec rectangle, right, for each of these slices we're making. And then um, what we need to do is we need to get, uh, again, conceptually the area of each rectangle, right, and then add them up to give us the total area under the function. So uh, the, the base width you know, if you're thinking in terms of areas, right, the base width is the difference between the AEPs at the two endpoints of the intervals, the high and low endpoint. So that's just a, simply taking the difference between the, between the two values. And then we need our um, probability of failure. Now, normally in these types of calculations, the probability of failure, you would calculate it corresponding to um, the average stage that you're using to represent that interval. Um, sometimes you'll see that referred to as kind of an index value or an index uh, stage. So basically, it's the stage you're using to represent um, uh, the rectangle. So the SRP, you need to correspond to that stage. So uh, we can pull the corresponding SRP for a stage of 101 from the system response curve. Again, this one's really simplified. This one is set up so all of the... Um, all the input functions have the same, um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence where they're all defined off of the same hazard values at the same increment, right? So these these all, you know, 100 to 120 in increments of two feet. System response curve um, is designed to correspond to our, those average stage values. That was all done by design, again, just to keep it simple. 
and same with the consequences correspond to all those average values in our increment. Um, normally in a real risk analysis that you're not going to get that kind of nice clean alignment of your input functions. So we we have to, you know, we'll often have to do some interpolation of values in between values that define our, our input functions. We didn't do that in this exercise because Excel um, is incredibly cumbersome in terms of doing linear interpolation with any of the built-in functions. Um, it can be done, but it's a pain in the neck um, in Excel, so we avoided it uh, for this exercise and just made it nice and clean. But in practice, it's not going to be clean. You're probably going to have to do some interpolation. Um, so these are the SRP values, and then uh, as what was noted in the, in, the, in the chat, right, if you sum up all these AEP values for each slice, right, it should cover the full range of the curve, which normally you would want that to be one. You want it to cover the whole probability space. But because we took a shortcut and said, well, we're, we only care about things above the toe, which is an AEP of 0.5 or less, and that's all we included in the calculation, then the summation of these um, increments should sum up to 0.5, which it does. So that makes that's a, that's just one of the ways you can you know do some quick checks of your risk model calculations to make things are make sure things are working out right. If this came out to something different than 0.5, it would it would mean we definitely had an error somewhere in our calculation that we would want to track down. Okay, so we have the SRP, and then we can pull the excess or incremental consequences, course, again, corresponding to this average stage value that we're using to represent that interval. And again, think of it as what we're using as the height of the rectangle, right, to represent the, um, the rectangle rule integration of our, of our function. And then the annual probability of failure for each of those intervals is just the, um, the AEP of the flood, so that's the delta AEP value times the system response probability. So you just multiply those two together, that gives you the annual probability of failure for that interval. And then for life loss, you just add on um, a multiplication of the consequences. So it's, you can either do it as the AEP of the interval on the hazard times the SRP times the consequences, or you can do it as, this, as it is done in here with just the APF value times the um, consequences. And then we, so that so that re, that's representative of the area of one slice, right, for our numerical integration. And then we just add those up um, across all of our slices, and that gives our estimate of that integral, which is the, the integral that we use to calculate risk. So we get the total annual probability of failure and the total annualized life loss estimate for that failure mode. Uh, failure mode two is pretty much filled out for you, except for doing the sum here pretty easy. Um, or no, sorry, the sum here was, was, it was all done for you. And then for our total risk estimate, the key concept here is that if we're, if we're making a simplifying assumption that these fairy modes are, we're going to model them as if they're mutually exclusive, then we can just add up both their probabilities, so their annual probabilities of failure, and we can add up their annualized life loss, and that gives us a total risk estimate for this. Uh, levy, and it would be a total estimate of the excess or the incremental risk. Okay, it uh, looks like there's a question in the chat about the geometric mean. Um, so in this one, um, again, this goes back to the concept of um, of linear linearization, right? So uh, hey, maybe it might be better if I call up, let me call up a... Uh, Call up this a slide out of this presentation because I think it might make more sense, right? So in this conceptual example, um, when you're doing this, these types of numerical integration, um, there's there's actually two ways you can get accuracy. One is if you make the rectangles really really small. The other is if you design them such that the errors here on the left, where the rectangle is above the curve. And the, the so this you know where the orange is sticking up above the curve, and this error on the on the right where you have this blank space where it's below the curve, right? If you if you design your rectangles so that those cancel each other out, right? So you have positive errors and negative errors, they'll cancel out, and you also get a more accurate estimate. So in this particular 
um, exercise in this type of application. Um, I'm not sure if it would be the right thing to do for this specific example, but there are cases where, especially if you have logarithmic functions, if you use the geometric mean, um, that will give you that will get you closer to canceling out those positive and negative errors, uh, which will help reduce the error in your estimate of the area under that curve. So hopefully that that makes um, some sense in terms of why you might choose to or not choose to do it. Again, if you pick really small intervals, it, it doesn't matter, right? If the intervals get small enough, it doesn't matter what you pick. You're going to be really accurate because the width of the intervals, you know, diminishingly small. But if you only have you know ten intervals like we do here, they're big enough where how you how you select to calculate the the midpoint or the average right might might matter. Okay, so this is the joint risk model. So in this model, we have we're basically assuming three outcomes can occur: either Fermi occurs by itself, or, or sorry, one occurs by itself, two occurs by itself, or one and two both occur. So the calculations on the on the loading how we break up the loading curve is the same. Um, the SRP um, changes. So because now there's, um, we're modeling um, the joint occurrence of two things. So for failure mode to occur, uh, one to occur by itself, we have to have failure mode one occur and failure mode two not occur, right? That's the only way that can happen. So that's, so we need the joint probability for those two things happening. Um, we know they're individual marginal probabilities. So what we do here in this SRP column is we take the probability of failure mode one happening from its system response curve, and then we multiply that because um, again joint joint probability and right is an intersection, so it's a multiplication. We then multiply it by the probability that failure mode two does not occur, which is one minus its system response probability. So that's where that formula comes in, and then down here it's it's um, it's it's just the opposite for ferry mode two. It's ferry mode two occurring and ferry mode one not occurring. So we take the SRP for ferry mode two, multiply it by one minus the SRP for ferry mode one. And then the joint probability of both of them occurring means both one and two occur. Um, again, it's an intersection, so it's a multiplication. Um, and then in this place, we multiply the probability of A occurring times the probability of B occurring. So probability of failure for one times the probability of failure for failure mode two. And you get um, those SRP values down here for the joint um, occurrence of both failure modes. And you can see here these, if you if you you know explore these column or these um, values, they're all pretty small relative to the values for the individual failure modes, right? So what this basically is telling you that the, the joint probability or the intersection of these two failure modes has a pretty small probability. So it's probably not going to have a big effect on our risk estimate. Um, and then the other thing you need to do on the consequences is you need to, in this example, you need to choose an assumption on what you're going to assume the consequences are if both failure modes occur. And one of the more common assumptions um, that you can make here is that you just take the maximum of the individual failure modes. So you assume that if both failure modes occur, the one that by itself would have caused the most consequences is what we're going to assume are the consequences when they both occur. Um, there's other options. You could sum them. You could take the average. Um, you know, and again, it depends on how your system is and how you would envision um, the flood occurring, right, and how those consequences might play out. Or, you know, if you wanted to, you could actually explicitly model this as a separate scenario and estimate consequences. We normally don't do that because when you get more than just, you know, two failure modes, the number of comb combinations gets quickly, uh, quickly gets large and it gets um, very cumbersome to estimate consequences for every individual scenario. So normally we just make an assumption, you know, we either you know, max is the most common, but there's other other options. And again, then the, the rest of the calculations are the same. And then now to get the total, now you have three three failure outcomes, right? One by itself, two by itself, or one and two together. Um, and those three outcomes are mutually exclusive so that you can um, just add up Again, you can still just add up the individual risk estimates to get the total risk with this model. So software that uses this type of framework is basically doing the calculations 
in a manner similar to this. Um, so those were the calculations. Um, yeah, so a question, a question in the chat about this, um, in this particular model, for, for one to occur alone, it means that one had to occur and two had to have not occurred. So in the joint risk model, to get the probabilities correct, you have to um, treat that as a joint event, right? It has to be one occurring with two not occurring. And to get the probability of that outcome, you have to multiply the probability of one occurring times the probability of two not occurring, which is one minus its system response probability. So yeah, you have to do that in this type of joint model. In the exclusive model, remember, we basically are pretending there's no intersection, right? So you don't have to worry about that issue because there is no intersection between the events. Um, but so this, this is one of those modeling things, right, where we make that simplification in the model knowing that in reality there's an intersection. What we're doing with the first model, the, the, the exclusive models, we're saying we think that intersection is small enough that if we ignore it, we're probably going to overestimate the risk, but we're probably not going to overestimate it enough that it's going to dramatically affect our decision, right? So we make that as a simplifying assumption. Um, if you want to be more precise, right, then you would pick something like the joint model or the competing risk model to say, no, I want to actually explicitly account for uh, what's happening in the location where those failure modes intersect, right? And so the joint model says, if I think both failure modes can occur, if I think that's physically possible, then the joint model is the way to go. And you have to set up the calculations this way to get the right probabilities. So again, in the exercise, you know, it was just kind of going through these calculations, filling in the miss missing pieces and writing down your answers and then doing some um, comparisons at the end. So in this example, if you compare this total risk estimate to the one from the previous model, they're pretty similar, right? That's, you know, 6.5 e to the minus three for annual probability failure versus 6.28 and point six if you round it for annualized life loss versus 0.59. So what you will typically see when you make this assumption to ignore the intersection is you will gener you will always overestimate the annual failure probability and you will usually overestimate the, the annualized life loss. But as you can see in this example, usually by not a lot, and that's because the system response probabilities are usually relatively small. Um, so, so that's just one thing to be aware of, right? That that it, you you'll be off a little bit, but usually not um, not so much that it would lead to lead you down a different decision pathway. Um, and then the competing risk model is another option, which we didn't do in the exercise because the calculations are um, quite a bit more complex to do by hand. So we left we left that one out. Um, but there is software that available that will do uh, do that for you. Okay, uh, so that goes over the solution.